When studying spiritual warfare, there is no better section of the Bible than Ephesians 6, where we are instructed to put on the six pieces of spiritual armor God has given us. From those six pieces of armor, the only weapon listed is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. However, today we come to another weapon which is just as powerful and maybe even more powerful in certain situations, the weapon of prayer. Most believers don't view prayer as a weapon. This may be because Paul does not align it to a piece of weaponry like he did the other six elements of the armor of God. This was not because the Roman soldier did not have any other weapons. They did. Besides the sword, the soldiers also had spears, bow and arrows, battering rams and catapults. But Paul does not compare any of these to prayer because none of them can even come close to the power, precision and effectiveness of the weapon of prayer. So since Paul doesn't give us a piece of battle gear to equate to the weapon of prayer, maybe we could even refer to it as our secret weapon. This is why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, to the pulling down of stronghold. In this verse, the weapon he's referring to is prayer. None of the other pieces of the armor of God was described the same way as prayer is described, as mighty, meaning that prayer is the ultimate weapon for a believer. It must never be forgotten that Almighty God rules this world. He is not an absent God. His hand is ever on the throttle of human affairs. He is everywhere at all times. And what you need to know is that there is nothing more important to God than a believer's prayer and faith. Prayer is the heartbeat of each and every believer. Warren Wisby said, everything that God does is an answer to prayer. And that's the truth because James said you have not simply because you ask not. God helps believers through prayer. He who does not pray therefore robs himself from God's help. Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, but by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. What we need to understand is the power that we have in prayer. Now the weapon of prayer is a force. It touches eternal powers and sets them into motion. It moves God into action and the devil into retreat. Because where there is no prayer, the devil advances. Did you hear me? Where there is no prayer, the devil advances. This is why we are told in everything and in every area we should pray. God will only give to you what you're willing to pray for. Are you in trouble? Are you in deep waters? Has the enemy come in like a flood? Let me tell you, my friend, there are situations in life that you cannot overcome any other way except through prayer. No other way except through prayer and prayer alone. Ephesians 4.27 says, Do not give the devil a chance. God is telling us himself, Do not give the devil a chance. Are you giving the devil a chance in your life? Today it has to stop. Don't allow the devil to ruin your life. Get on your knees and fight back. Stop allowing the devil to destroy your health. The Bible says I will bring you health. Stop allowing the devil to break up your family. The Bible says, let no man separate what God has joined together. Stop allowing the devil to tell you your life is over. The Bible says, your God will restore everything you have lost. Everything you have lost. Stop allowing the devil to inject the spirit of fear into your life. The Bible says, God has not given you the spirit of fear. Stop allowing the devil to tell you that God only answers the prayers of the righteous. The Bible says the righteousness of Jesus has been imputed into you. Stop allowing the devil to tell you your situation is hopeless. You need to know that Jesus is your hope. You don't have to take his stuff. You don't have to take it. Call on God through prayer. Use the weapon that you have been given, the weapon of prayer. Prayer opens up the gates of heaven and closes the gates of hell. Prayer uproots and destroys demonic power and influences. Prayer lifts you higher to a place you cannot go by yourself. Prayer invokes the supernatural power of God. 
prayer opens up resources not known to men. You have a host of angels ready, waiting to intervene in your situation, but you are silent. Why are you silent? Suffering in silence, in pain in silence, dying in your sin in silence, living with a broken heart in silence, putting a smile on for the world, but crying yourself to sleep at night. This is something I struggle with myself. Even when I am not alright, if someone asks me, I always say I'm fine. But we don't have to live like this. Each and every one of us have been given the ability to call on God. He can end your suffering. He can ease your pain. He can save you from your sin. He can heal your broken heart. He can heal the damage that man did to you. He can heal that damage that woman did to you because he loves you and cares for you. The truth is life is not fair. It really is not fair at times. Not everybody gets the same breaks and the same opportunities. And with life, the burdens and the storms will come and they can get so difficult that you even struggle to breathe. And life can break your heart in a multitude of ways. Your spouse or your loved one leaves you and moves on with their life. And fast forward two years on, you're still there, left, trying to pick up the pieces. And they've moved on. Your business experiences difficulties through no fault of your own. You went to every meeting, you treated your customers right, you did everything right. And it just doesn't work out and you're left with a broken heart. Your loved one dies unexpectedly and you don't know what to do with yourself. And you're left with memories and a broken heart. Your health gets taken away from you, completely out of the blue. And you're there left with a broken heart. I don't know what's broken your heart today, but there's only one that can heal a broken heart. The one who said, cast your care upon me, for I careth for you. Jesus cares for you. Jesus cares for you. He can heal your broken heart. I've not lived your life and you've not lived my life. I don't know the burdens, the pain that you've had to endure. But one thing we do have in common is that we've got one precious Savior, one precious Jesus, and He can heal your broken heart. All you have to do is ask. Jeremiah 33 3 says, Call on me and I will answer you. Did you know prayer is the language of calling upon God? The devil will do everything in his power to stop you from praying and he will try to even block your prayers. Look at Daniel 10 verse 12. When an angel was speaking to Daniel, he said, Then he said to me, Do not fear, Daniel. From the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard. And I have come because of your word. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me for 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief prince, came to help me. For I had been left alone there with the king of Persia. Notice how the angel said because of your words. Your breakthrough is on its way. But you need to carry on fighting using the weapon of prayer. You need to have an aggressive, fiery, relentless attitude with your prayer life. But unfortunately, anytime our prayers are not answered, instantly we give up. We need to persist with crying out to the Lord. We need to have a whatever it takes attitude with our prayer life. Oh Jesus, oh Jesus, I need you to come through. I need you to come through on your promises. You said to me, call on me in the day of trouble. I'm in trouble. If you don't do something for me here, I won't survive. I need you to come through for me. God, you promised me. You promised me that you would be with me. You promised me that you would fight for me, that you would give your angels charge over me. God will answer your prayer. You don't have to fight the battles of life alone. You have God on your side, but he's waiting on you to ask. When was the last time you used the weapon of prayer? And I'm not talking about that soft prayer that you always recite 
every single day. I mean the type of prayer where your whole spirit is involved, where you throw everything you have inside of you and you don't even need to shout. It can just come from the heart. You have a prayer warrior inside you. You need to stop letting life and the devil kick you around. Call on God. Tell yourself, I might be old, but I'm a prayer warrior. I might be young, but I'm a prayer warrior. I might be a saint, but I'm a prayer warrior. If my people called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. What's involved in this? God expects us to pray. But we must not forget what Jonathan Edwards said when he said to promote explicit agreement and visible union of all God's people in extraordinary prayer. What do you mean by extraordinary prayer? When you find people getting up at six o'clock in the morning to pray, or having a half night of prayer till midnight, that's extraordinary prayer. When they give up their lunch time and go and pray at a noonday prayer meeting, that's extraordinary prayer. But it must be united and concerted. It doesn't mean that a Baptist becomes any less of a Baptist, or that an Episcopalian is less loyal to the 39 Articles, or that a Presbyterian turns his back on the Westminster Confession. Not at all. But they recognize each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, and they're prepared to pray together in concerted prayer that God may hear and answer. We haven't reached that stage yet. But you folk who are here, those who listen to my voice, must take it back to your churches. And when they're prepared to set aside time to pray for a spiritual awakening, that's when God is going to answer. Now some people say that means then it's up to us. Oh no, we can't say that either. Matthew Henry said, when God intends great mercy for his people, he, first of all, sets them a praying. Even God is sovereign in this matter. But we must respond. He has chosen never to work without our cooperation. The Bible invites us over and over to pray, John 16, 23. And in that day, you will ask of me nothing. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask, the Father in my name, he will give it you. Until now, you have not asked me for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be complete. You need to get to the point where you believe God's word wholeheartedly and say to yourself, if God said it, I believe it. Tell yourself, if God said it, I believe it. God is a God who hears the cries of his people. Have faith in God. A Christian that does not pray is a weak Christian. A Christian that does not pray is a vulnerable Christian. Living a prayerless life is living an exposed life. Any wind and wave can come along and blow you to and fro. Jesus said, men are always to pray and not faint. Are you about to faint? Jesus said, don't faint. Don't give up, don't run. God said in Jeremiah 33, three, call unto me and I will answer you. Not Gabriel, not Michael, but God himself said, I will answer you. When you are at the edge of giving up, when you have run out of your own resources, mental resources, physical resources, emotional resources, when you have gone as far as you can go, that's just the beginning of God. He can do exceedingly above all that we can ask or think. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. The only thing that can change your situation is prayer. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 7, when you pray, not if you pray, but when. Prayer is not an option for the believer. Prayer is not a last resort when all else has failed. 
As a child of God, you are instructed to have a continual conversation with God. A three-worded Bible verse that will walk you through your Christian life in Thessalonians 5.17. Pray without ceasing. That means talk to your God constantly. At one point or another in our lives, we all have prayed and asked God to do something for us. But it didn't happen as quickly as we wanted it to happen. Over the years in my life, I have learned that God's delays are not God's denials. The spiritual realm is vastly bigger than the natural world. We don't know what is going on in the spiritual realm unless God reveals it to us. We don't know what is going on behind the scenes on our behalf. In the Old Testament, there is a captivating story about Daniel's prayer being heard in heaven. Daniel is visited by an angel whose name is not disclosed. This angel explains that he would have come sooner, but he was engaged in battle for 21 days by the prince of the kingdom of Persia. And he required the assistance of Michael the archangel to overcome this prince. The angel spent three weeks earnestly attempting to visit Daniel, but he lacked the power to overcome the prince of Persia. You see, the spirit realm is a realm of great conflict. The prayer of Daniel went to heaven. His prayer was heard, and his prayer was answered, and an angel was dispatched with the answer. But the angel was unable to get through to Daniel because of this apparently high-ranking demon power that stopped him. What can we learn from this is that demon powers have different ranks and powers, just like the angels that belong to the kingdom of God have different ranks and powers. In Ephesians 6.12 we are told, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The Bible refers to Michael the Archangel. We know from the scriptures that he plays a unique role in God's plan and appears to be a high-ranking angel. Then we have Gabriel, who also must have been a high-ranking angel. He was sent with a specific message for Joseph and Mary concerning the arrival of the Messiah. In fact, there are only three angels who are named in the Bible, Michael the Archangel, Gabriel, and Lucifer, who of course is a fallen angel. Now back to the story of Daniel. What we need to realize is that Daniel's prayer had such powerful effects in the spiritual realm, so much so it helped one angel call for reinforcements. We also need to realize it's no accident that the messenger said that his struggle with the prince of Persia lasted exactly the same amount of time that Daniel's fasting and prayer did, 21 days. The reason for this is that the warfare in the spirit realm was being fought in a real sense by Daniel in the prayer realm. Now imagine if Daniel had given up on the 10th day or had given up on the 19th day, Daniel would have blocked his angel from reaching him. So I have a question for you today. Are you blocking your angel? Let me ask you again, are you blocking your angel? Why do we give up on prayer? Is it discouragement? We ask for something and don't see results, or we don't like what happens and assume God isn't listening or at least not giving a favorable answer. We all want our prayers to get answered right away. When we don't see the answer immediately, we can be tempted to stop praying. I've had people ask, how do I know when I should give up on a prayer? My answer is always the same, never! We can never quit turning to God. Remember the things that are impossible with men are possible with God. Our problem is that we now live in the age of the instant and some things just don't happen that way. The Bible says that God is pleased with the passionate prayer of the righteous. It's not about the length of your prayer. It's the strength of your faith, your passion. I want to encourage you to keep knocking and don't give up. Prayer is the answer to your problem today, not a human. 
Not the doctor, not your lawyer, not a psychologist. Your prayer to the God of heaven is the answer. Just because we don't see a change doesn't mean our words are not heard, but rather that there is a fight going on and it's up to you to engage and fight with your prayers. Prayer opens up the gates of heaven. Prayer brings God onto the scene. Prayer lifts you higher to places you cannot go yourself. The things that are impossible with men are possible with God. Be the type of person who is passionate about prayer because that is the kind of person who will also be effective in prayer. Be the type of person who does not give up on their prayer because that kind of person does not block their angel. Be the type of person who does not give up on their prayer because that kind of person can touch heaven with their prayers. Luke 11, 9. And so I tell you, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be opened to you. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. Luke 18, 1. In the parable of the persistent widow, Jesus teaches us that prayer is not just a one-off ticking a box matter. Although he encourages us that our Heavenly Father will hear our prayer, he also leaves no doubt that we may need to pray repeatedly and persistently until we receive our answer. If you have been praying for something and are still waiting for God to answer, this is for you. Do not lose heart. Do not be discouraged. Persist just as the widow persisted. Persistent prayer is perhaps the weapon our enemy Satan fears the most. This is why he will try and discourage us to not keep praying if we don't see a breakthrough right away. The Bible is a book that teaches persistence, and you and I need to persist with our prayer life. Persistence is worth the cost. The payoff is exceedingly abundantly above all you could ever imagine. But most believers don't do that. That's why there are so many faith failures around. They stand on the word or pray for one day, two days, nine days and fall off. They are never willing to pay the price of persistence. What we need to do is persist. Jesus said if we'd continue in his word, then we'd be his disciples. Jesus in his life on earth demonstrated and taught hardcore, backbreaking and no nonsense persistence. He said if we'd continue, we would know the truth and that the truth would make us free, John 8, 31 through 32. There's a revelation of God that comes from persistence that the inconsistent person will never see. Determined today to be persistent. There comes a time when you have to have some aggression, some tenacity and some might about you. And you have to stand up and fight back no matter what is happening to you. No matter how hard the fight is, as long as you keep fighting, you will win. The devil only wins if you let him. Life will only win if you let it. Fight on, fight on, fight on. Don't tell me you can't fight anymore. Don't tell me you can't fight anymore. Don't tell me I'm tired and alone. After all you have been through, you've got to take a stand. You've got to take a stand. Stand in the middle of heartache. Stand in the middle of calamity. Stand in the middle of the storm. Stand in the middle of chaos. Stand in the middle of failure. Stand firm in the name of Jesus Christ. Whatever it is, it will not defeat you. If it is an illness, fight back against it. It will not win. It will not win. The devil and his army cannot stop what God has ordained for you in 2020. You will experience the blessings of the Lord this year. The crown of favor is upon your head. God will open doors for you. 
But your duty, your responsibility is to be bold like a lion. Look at the ones who have gone before you. Moses, described in the Bible as the meekest man ever. Yet Moses had the boldness to go face to face with the most powerful man on earth at that time and told him, let my people go. Boldness, the great soldier Joshua, who took the sword and led the children of Israel to conquer kingdom after kingdom after kingdom after kingdom. Boldness, King David, who slayed a lion, a bear and a giant as a small boy. Boldness. You can't be bold if you see yourself as a victim. You can't be bold if you see yourself as a loser. You can't be bold if you see yourself as a coward. This is the year you realize you have the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob on your side. And he has equipped you and he has fashioned you and shaped you to be more than a conqueror. This is the year for you to walk in boldness. God's angels will protect you. His angels will minister to you. They will walk with you. The Holy Spirit will dwell inside you and will guide you. Victory will follow you. The crown of favor is upon your head. God has favored you. God has invested the blood of Jesus in you. You have royal blood running through your veins. This year is the year for you to finally take a stand in the name of Jesus. You are a warrior. You are a child of God. Don't you dare let the devil dictate another year of your life. There's a revelation of God that comes from persistence that the inconsistent person will never see. Determine today to be persistent. Don't try to base today on yesterday's prayer time. Base today on today's time with Him. Start a persistent prayer time today. Then tomorrow, get up and do it again. And the day after that, get up and do it again. And the day after that, get up and do it again. And the day after that, get up and do it again. Don't you dare give up. Don't block your angel. For all you know, your answer, your prayer could be in the middle of the battle right now. It has been said that Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saints upon their knees. I can confidently say that many of you here today are facing an enemy. When I say this statement, people automatically jump to a conclusion that an enemy is a human opposition. But an enemy is not always a person. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? Ephesians 6.12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The enemy is not necessarily a person. For some of you, it may present itself in the form of an illness. It may have haunted your family for years. You say your grandmother had it, your mother had it, and now you've accepted the fact that you're going to have it. And you sit there saying it runs in the family, when in reality, it's the enemy. It is the enemy attacking you and your family in every single generation, using the same strategy the same game plan and I am afraid to say some of you just let it happen it is time for it to stop today you must stop the enemy for others the enemy may present itself in your financial life you know that your financial goals are attainable and you have been trying for years but for one reason or another you haven't been able to achieve it. You may have a great job that pays well, but for some reason, you always find yourself behind on bills and struggling to keep up. 
Some of you may save a lot of money. Maybe you want to buy a new house or new car. But then something always comes up that sets you back and you find yourself at the square one again. And for many of us, if not all of us, the enemy you are facing is a sin. A sin you have been struggling with for years. And you have grown accustomed to it and have repeated it so much that you no longer feel the guilt once you commit it. And for others, the enemy may be a series of unfortunate circumstances that always happen to you. And the world has lied to you and told you that you are just an unlucky individual. As children of God, we do not believe in luck because luck runs out. As a child of God, you are blessed and highly faithful and the blessings of the Lord never run out. But some have gone your whole life experiencing an enemy of progress. In everything you do, it goes wrong. You take one step forward and the enemy of progress pulls you two steps back. I may not have stated the enemy that you are currently facing, but you know what battle you are in the middle of. And you may feel like you are losing the battle right now. And it looks like everything is closing in on you. And hell is about to throw the finishing blow. But the God we serve do not leave us defenseless. He left us all with prayer. For some of you, the situation is so dark and dismal that even when you try to pray, no words come out. Are you currently in that situation? Or have you ever been in that situation? Church of Jesus Christ, I encourage you to pray on. You need to pray as if your life depends on it, because it does. A Christian that does not pray is a weak Christian. A Christian that does not pray is a vulnerable Christian. Living a prayerless life is living an exposed life. Any wind and wave can come along and blow you to and fro. Jesus said, men are always to pray and not faint. Are you about to faint? Jesus said, don't faint. Don't give up. Don't run. God said in Jeremiah 33, 3, call unto me and I will answer you. Not Gabriel, not Michael, but God himself said, I will answer you. When you are at the edge of giving up, when you have run out of your own resources, mental resources, physical resources, emotional resources, when you have gone as far as you can go, that's just the beginning of God. He can do exceedingly above all that we can ask or think. Many are the afflictions of the righteous but the Lord delivers them out of them all. The only thing that can change your situation is prayer. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 7, when you pray, not if you pray, but when. Prayer is not an option for the belief. Prayer is not a last resort when all else is failed. As a child of God, you are instructed to have a continual conversation with God. A three-worded Bible verse that will walk you through your Christian life in Thessalonians 5.17. Pray without ceasing. That means talk to your God constantly. Talk to Him throughout the day, first thing in the morning, last thing at night, when you are eating breakfast, when you are traveling to work, when you are on your lunch break, at work, at the gym, at home. There is no substitute for prayer. Don't ever stop praying. Don't ever stop calling upon the name of the Lord. You need to have an aggressive prayer life. Prayer goes further than you can go. Prayer transcends time, space, and matter. 
Prayer opens up the gates of heaven and shuts the gates of hell. In whatever situation you find yourself, pray, pray, pray. In whatever season in your life, pray. God wants to do a great and mighty things in your life. The Bible says, you have not because you ask not. The initiative lies with you. Do not be afraid in your situation. Yes, there is an enemy you are facing. Yes, there's an adversary who is the devil. But fear not because your Father in heaven is God and there is no one higher than him. With God, all things are possible. He can do above and beyond all that you can ask or think. Your God can do anything. Prayer is the foundation of your continual communion with God. How do you expect to have a relationship with God when you don't communicate with Him? Once you begin to have an intense prayer life, you realize that if you're sick, He is a doctor. If you're in trouble, He is a lawyer. If you are drowning, He is a lifeguard. If you are lost, He will save you. He will be with you in the fire. He will be with you in the water. Through the good times and the bad times, He will be with you. There's power in prayer. With prayer, you can walk through the very shadow of death because you know you have a relationship with God. And he said, uh, do not fret or be anxious about anything. Now, as we said, that's King James translation. First said, be careful for nothing. I quoted another translation that makes it more explicit. King James said, be careful for nothing. That sort of falls on deaf ears, doesn't it? Be careful for nothing. <laughs> we just don't talk that way today. But this other translation is much clearer. Do not fret or have any anxiety about anything. Anything. Praise God. Now, you know, when James said, be doers of the word, not hearers only, that means that's, that's the word. That's the word of God. Then do that. Do that. Somebody said, well, I can't. Yes, you can. God's not unjust. He's not going to ask you to do something you couldn't do. Looks to me like anybody would be glad not to fret. Looks to me like anybody would be glad not to be anxious, overly anxious. Looks to me like anybody would be glad not to have to worry. Amen? Well, what are you going to do about it then? In everything. How many things? Everything. By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. That again is an invitation for you to come with your needs, hallelujah, and bring them to the Lord. Can you say amen? The Bible invites us over and over to pray John 16, 23. And in that day, you will ask of me nothing. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Until now, you have not asked me for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be complete. You need to get to the point where you believe God's word wholeheartedly and say to yourself, if God said it, I believe it. Tell yourself, if God said it, I believe it. God is a God who hears the cries of his people. Have faith in God. Make sure you subscribe to the new Line of Judah Prayer channel. Click the link in the description. Prayer is certainly one of the greatest privileges we have as believers. Whether we take full advantage of this privilege is another issue. We have as believers a fellowship with the Father. 
It is a medium of communication to him. When teaching the disciples to pray, Jesus taught them in this order, Our Father. Prayer subjects us to the fatherhood of God. Prayer energizes us to do the will of the Father. Matthew 6.10 As a matter of fact, prayer is a necessity in our Christian walk with God. Paul admonished in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, Pray without ceasing. What then does it mean to pray in the Spirit? Praying in the Spirit is relying on the Spirit of God to help us in the place of prayer. Like Apostle Paul rightly said in Romans 8.26, We do not know what we ought to pray about, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Praying in the Spirit is the giving up of self for the governorship of the Spirit because we do not know the will of the Father. Therefore, we need an intercessor to mediate on our behalf. We must understand that all prayer is accepted on the basis of intercession. Praying in the Spirit is received through faith in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.26 Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Ephesians 6.18 And pray in the Spirit on all occasions and with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Jude 1.20 But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. 1 Corinthians 14.15 What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. You know, my brothers and sisters, most of us don't believe these verses. At least many of us don't. If we did, we would pray more. We would make prayer the principal thing in our life. Each of these verses lays emphasis on the importance of praying in the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit is a prayer of the saint backed up by the power of the Holy Spirit to communicate with the Father. Every saint is expected to pray in the Spirit as an act of intimacy with the Father. Praying in the Spirit keeps you in the conscious state of your position in Christ Jesus without condemnation and equally emboldens you as an heir of God and joint heirs with Christ. Psalm 38, 9 All my longings lie open before you, Lord. My groanings and sighing is not hidden from you. He hears your groaning. He hears your sighing. He hears the Holy Spirit which intercedes for you. This word intercede means to meet, to bend over, and to plead for. The Holy Spirit is doing all that for you. Here we come with our needs and the Holy Spirit meets us, bends over us, sees our needs, and it pleads for us. Isn't that wonderful? To know that when we pray, we don't have to do it alone. But that's not it. We don't end there. Not only is the Holy Spirit interceding for you, but Jesus is also. I have an intercessor up in heaven. Jesus Christ is making intercession for me. I have an intercessor down here on earth. 
The Holy Spirit of God is making intercession for me with groanings that are incapable of being uttered. They are so deep. Intercession is the heart of all prayer. Everything is on the basis of intercession. Your prayers would not have been heard if it wasn't for intercession. Now I ask you today, why are you not praying, my friend? You don't have to do it alone. I am here simply to encourage you. Some of you have been going through years of trouble, years of challenges, and some of you that are listening to me right now are going through or have been through breakups, betrayals, divorces, deaths, despair, trauma, adversity, torment, pain, heartache, misery, and you're tired of always being in some sort of trouble. And there is only one thing you can do in times of trouble. And the Bible tells us what we are supposed to do in James 5.13. Is any among you in trouble? Is any among you in trouble? Let them pray. My God, maybe if I say it again, someone will hear me. Are you in trouble? Have you been broken by a bitter divorce? Have you been knocked down by a doctor's report? Have you been disappointed? Have you lost a loved one? Have you lost a love? Are you in trouble? Have you lost all hope? Is trouble all around you? Let them pray. In whatever situation you find yourself in life, pray your way out. Pray your way out when things are going wrong. Pray your way out when you're surrounded by enemies. Pray your way out when enemies are on your trail. Pray your way out when you're in distress. God is in heaven, literally waiting on you to call upon him. He says in his word, call unto me and I will answer you. He said, I will answer you. Your father, your heavenly father is waiting on you, literally sitting on the edge of his seat, surrounded by innumerable number of angels with the resources of heaven and earth at his fingertips, waiting and ready to come help you and to intervene in your situation. But you do not pray. The Lord your God is ready to feed you in front of your enemies, to make them your footstool. He's ready to deliver you out of the trouble you are facing. But we do not ask. The Bible says you do not have because you do not ask. Don't limit God. Don't limit God by your situation. I know it looks impossible. I know it looks like the odds are stacked against you. I know it looks like the odds are stacked against you. I know looking from a logical point of view, there is no way out. But don't limit God. He is bigger than human comprehension. God is bigger than your trouble. He is a God that is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you can ask or think. He is a God that is sovereign in his rule and sovereign in his nature. Stop crying about your situation. Stop feeling sorry for yourself about your situation and pray and pray to the Lord God Almighty to give you strength. If only you knew how important your prayer life is to your natural life, you would not be so lackadaisical about it. All of our problems are going to be solved by prayer. Solving of every problem, the provision of every need, the victory of every battle, the fulfillment of every purpose, it's all wrapped up in praying. Everything God does is an answer to prayer. Even the second coming of Jesus Christ is going to be an answer to prayer. The last prayer in the Bible is, Even so, come, Lord Jesus. God never ignores his children. He is never too busy, never lacking in resources. He is always attentive, always gracious, always eager, always wise, 
always loving. He hears every request from his humble, trusting children, and he answers with whatever is best. It always pays to pray. Praying in the Spirit is valuable and possible for every Christian. Its value is immeasurable, as it is the medium by which we build up ourselves. Jude 1.20 Prayer in itself draws us closer to the Father, while praying in the Spirit builds up our faith. The Bible affirms to us in Hebrews 11.6 that without faith, no one can please the Lord. This implies that praying in the Spirit is pleasing to the Father. It shows that our strength is drawn from the Spirit because we are weak in ourselves. Moreover, it demonstrates our total dependency on God and His power. There is no doubt that the life of the Spirit can only be fostered by praying in the Spirit, as the scripture says in Psalm 42, 7, Deep calleth unto the deep. In fact, it is a way of living out of the words of Jesus when he said, John 4, 24, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. In essence, this is the spirit of God reaching deep into the spirit of his children, bypassing everything that would attempt to hinder that sweet communion and fellowship that God passionately desires to have with us. He demonstrated this in the Garden of Eden. He is still in the business of drawing men to himself. Praying in the Spirit becomes the medium in which we are drawn. It is altogether a divine activity that one fits through faith in Jesus Christ. Praying in the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, and worshipping in the Spirit, in spirit and in truth, John 4.24, is to come before God according to His divine means. That is through the One whom the Spirit magnifies, the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 8.26-27 Make sure you subscribe to the new Line of Judah Prayer channel. Click the link in the description. Throughout the scriptures from the beginning to the end, from Genesis chapter 1 right through to Revelation chapter 21, we discover numerous accounts of angels intervening in the lives of human beings. And every encounter that we read in the Bible I can tell you one thing for sure, that angel was not there by accident. When we read Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14, it says this about angels. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to them who are the heirs of salvation? And who are the heirs of salvation? Well, that my friend is you and me. We are the heirs of salvation. You see, First and foremost, we must understand that these angels are ministering spirits. They are here to help us to complete and to do God's will. Psalms 91 verse 9 to 12. If you say, the Lord is my refuge, and you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you, no disaster will come near thy dwelling, for he will command his angels to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. In Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14, where it states we are the heirs of salvation. That word salvation means rescue or safety, deliverance from the harassment of the enemies. The enemies being referred to here is the devil and his henchmen. So many of the children of God are being harassed by the adversary. Whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not. The adversary does not like you and is out to get you and he'll do everything in his power to do so. 
there's nothing personal against you. He could care less about you. But the devil knows that he can't compete with God. He can't come anywhere near the power of God Almighty. So the only way he can get back at God for what happened to him in Luke 10 verse 18 when he was cast out of heaven like lightning is by going after God's object of affection. That's you and that's me. Yes, you. You are the object of God's affection. He loves you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And unfortunately, so many of God's children are being harassed by the adversary and his tools. For example, fear, anxiety, stress, burnout, overthinking, pressure, crisis over here, crisis over there, bad news here, bad news there, and they are caught up in the middle of a fight. You know that I am a big advocate of viewing life as a fight. Life is a fight and anything worth having in life, you will have to fight for it. The sooner you come to that realization, the better. To get a promotion, you will have to fight to get yourself in a position where you can be seen to get a promotion. Even in your own family life, you will have to fight, not against each other, but against the challenges that face your family. Nahum 4 verse 14 Fight for your brothers, fight for your sons, fight for your daughters, fight for your wives, fight for your houses. Your family is worth fighting for. Life in general is a fight. And as you are listening to me right now, in some capacity, you are involved in a fight. Whether it's a fight for your health, a fight for your family, or a fight for good grades. In some form or fashion, you are involved in a fight and you will have to get used to it. The enemy will try to do everything to ensure he overwhelms you while you are facing the battles of life. If the truth be told, you are fighting fights, you are fighting battles, you don't need to fight alone. Psalms 35 verse one, fight those who fight against me. If you're fighting sickness, God will fight for you. If you're fighting adversity, God will fight for you. If you're fighting trouble, God will fight for you. And further on in that chapter, it says, let the angel of the Lord chase them. Here is the bottom line. You are fighting fights. You don't need to fight alone. You have angelic angels that are under the command of God, ready to help you, but they are waiting on you. God has not left you alone in life. God has not abandoned you. He is ready, not just ready, but willing to send you help to help you in the fight. But he is waiting on you. When Peter was sent to prison in the book of Acts, it was not an accident when the angel sent by God appeared out of thin air in the midst of Peter's cell and broke his chains as easily as glass shattering on a concrete floor. No, it was no accident that that angel told him, Peter, get up and follow me. And as they walked past guard after guard after guard, not one of them could stop them in their path. Peter was able to walk out the front gates of the prison without even the smallest bit of resistance. I don't think you are hearing me. Peter escaped out of prison from the front door. He just walked out. He didn't need to do a James Bond or a Mission Impossible. He didn't need to scale a 10 foot wall. No, why? Because Peter had been assigned an angel with such power that he was able to walk out of the front door. And make no mistake about it, the angel was not there to help him by accident. He was sent on assignment by God. It is no accident that the angel was there to set him free. What caused the angel to come? Acts 12 verse 5 Peter therefore was kept in prison but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Prayer was made without ceasing. God is willing to help you in your situation. God is willing to help you. He's not just willing to help you. He is able to help you. He's not just able to help you. He wants to help you in your situation. 
Pray without ceasing. Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. Our problem is that we do not ask. God wants to help you. You are fighting fights. You don't need to fight alone. You have angelic angels that are under the command of God, ready to help you, but they are waiting on you. God has not left you alone in life. God has not abandoned you. He is ready, not just ready, but willing to send you help to help you in the fight, but he is waiting on you. We are fighting fights. We don't need to fight alone. You are not alone in this matter. God wants to help you. You are fighting fights. You don't need to fight alone. Get on your knees and pray. Be vigilant with your prayer life. Be aggressive with your prayer life. Be forceful with your prayer life.